Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about something that is pretty complex. If you enjoy poetry, if you enjoy philosophy, um, if you're a little bit of a cynic, honestly, then today's lecture may be for you. Some surprising movements that have happened in theater in the last hundred years and um, this is some, you know, probably some new material for you, some things that you haven't been exposed to. Uh, I'll use the word avant-garde a lot today, and that is just French for new, um, for something disturbing or something um, inventive, uh, a lot of postmodern abstractions. So if you've ever um, admired abstract piece of art like Rothko or uh, Pollock, you know, these are kind of the theater equivalent to those paintings. So before we get into the avant-garde though, let's talk about realism, which what which was what that avant-garde, those abstract, those um, absurdist plays were about, uh, reacting against. Remember we said almost every major movement, you know, we have a uh, reaction against the movement before it. So we talked about realism when we spoke about the need for a director. And realism uh, depicts a daily mundane struggle. Uh, not a lot of human interest in watching somebody iron clothes, uh, but this is A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, a wonderful American, African-American play. And, um, you know, that was part of the reality of uh, their lifestyle. And so it was part of the depiction on stage. Mm, granted, there was dialogue going on, but uh, realism has local speech patterns. So if you um, are watching a realistic play or reading, for example, Eugene O'Neill's uh, Anna Christie, uh, it's set in a... Um, in a port town, uh, presumably New Jersey, and and you can hear sign of the oits and the uh, the accent is written. It's in written in an accent. And so um, if you kind of read it initially, it may uh, be a little bit confusing. You might have to figure out you know how they're speaking. Um, visceral details, trying to get to kind of a grotesque human reality. You want to see the sweat on their brown, on their brow. Um, if you uh, look at, you know, a modern play, something, um, not a play, I'm sorry, a movie, uh, Precious, um, by Sapphire. You can actually see, you know, Precious's sweat. You can, um, it has a gritty, you can see their teeth, you know, it just has a very visceral quality to it. Another thing to think about realism was the illusion of the fourth wall. So in our first lecture of the semester, we talked about the actor on stage having a certain relationship with the audience. And um, when I give a soliloquy and look directly into the eyes of the audience, uh, the same way that um, Ferris Bueller looked into the camera and said they bought it, right? Then I'm breaking that fourth wall. Now, in order to keep realism going, um, we're going to create what we call the illusion of the fourth wall, which means that nobody in the audience looks um, and makes direct eye contact with the people on stage. They are committed to this reality amongst themselves, and you're just kind of the creepy um, guy looking through the window stalking them <laughs> in most realistic theater. You're just the uh, innocent bystander um, watching this story unfold. And that was the uh, premise. This was kind of an, a predominant style in theater. So... As we look at these other art forms, you can kind of compare it to the status quo, which is realism. Once again, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, I believe, is a realistic play. We can um, enjoy Bertha's biscuits, right? We can smell them cooking. We can see people eating them on stage. Um, there's a lot of talk of money, um, and that is a very... Uh, Def clearly defined form of um, realism. So when Seth talks about how many um, uh, 
pieces of tin he needs in order to make dustpans and how much money he could make if he hired his own worker. He gets into the dollars and the cents of it. And that would have been considered uh, maybe before a Victorian time as sort of crass. You know, that's not something, um, that's not high-minded. That's not something that Hamlet is going to soliloquize about um, how many uh, dustpans he can get out of a piece of tin, <laughs> right? Um, so this gritty, this more honest, uh, this menial stuff of every day is what realism is about. Um, earthiness, right? Um, th like we said, uh, the using the N word, for example, uh, Joe, uh, August Wilson said, I'll stop writing it when people stop saying it. And so he was trying to realistically portray um, the way that he thinks that those people would have spoken. Uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone is also an example of realism in the way um, that there is crass sexuality. And we'll get back to that when we talk about a couple examples of realism. Um, but uh, remember, as we come into this Darwinistic age, uh, people are compared to animals more readily. And um, sex is then approached as more of an animalist, animalistic instinct rather than um, some sacred, romantic, holy kind of endeavor. Uh, so when we hear Jeremy, you know, um, speak pretty crassly about women or switch partners very quickly, um, that would kind of have the same um, uh, implications uh, of, of a realistic environment. And once again, not in, the, not in the sense that a bunch of men are out there running around. Uh, my husband is very faithful to me. Realism as a genre. <laughs> uh, although I don't know your experience. Um, okay, so realism was a reaction to uh, the Shakespeare's uh, and classical theater's depictions of kings and gods and only talking about um, people that were worthy, according to Aristotle's poetics. If a poor person came on stage, they weren't taken seriously, right? That poor person would have been the butt of a joke, such as Falstaff um, in the Henry V. Um, another thing that happened before realism was two-dimensional backgrounds. So um, they would have just looked, looked like painted, uh, remember we talked about uh, painted backdrops, kind of, um, uh, they're just being, um, you know, very, not having a lot of depth, uh, just painted perspective rather than um, it looking realistic in any real way which would have been considered an art form, but let's face it, it's not as easy to suspend your disbelief when it's just a painted tree, right, instead of a real tree on stage. Um, another thing that you kind of have to understand as to why um, melodramatic theater came before, or romantic theater came before, is the limitations that they had uh, uh, with their technology. So when you are playing Hamlet in the globe, uh, you have to stand at the edge of the stage because the people around you have to be able to see you. Um, if you were in an indoor theater, like a Jacobean theater, it, in the court of King James, you would, um, you know, you'd have to stand down center in the little bit of footlight that you had. If we look at an actor like Charlie Chaplin, you know, nobody uh, that I know who's an actor would say that Charlie Chaplin was a bad actor. Uh, he was an amazing, um, you know, able to use his body to tell the story. He had a lot of physical humor that he could act out, but his style of acting was to be perceived on a silent stage and so he wore way too much makeup so that when we watched the movie we could differentiate his facial features because we all know that the film quality was not HD right um, and so when we pick on these melodrama um, plays and kind of ha 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 they're so ridiculous we just have to remember the technology limitations that they had in vaudeville for example we're playing on dark stages and crowded rooms uh, so that declamatory style people poetic um, uh, you know, elocutionizing. Um, it, it was it was a style that was um, 
partially inhibited by the technology. So when realism comes about when we have the invention of the light bulb and when we have um, the ability with these new directors to create these spaces um, where people can hear and see and so now we can just have a conversation. It's not about trying to speak loudly enough so the people in the back can hear you because we have the money to facilitate these great spaces. Um, so this is a play we did at Motlow called Mouse Trap. It's a Agatha Christie uh, play. You may know Agatha Christie. She's a famous, a famous British novelist. And um, in the book, it kind of is hard on box sets because they aren't necessarily something that's going to win any sort of award for its ingenuity. Uh, it's basically three sides um, of a stage and uh, you are, like I said, through the proscenium, you're looking in like you're looking in a window. Um, but as you can see, our our set designer uh, really just did a fantastic job on all of the little details. This is a realistic portrayal, so you can see we have a real radiator down there. You can see the stained glass window. You can see the snow collecting on the window. All of that attention to detail is very important in realistic theater. So even though it's not... Um, necessarily metaphoric or in any way um, lofty. It's pragmatic and it's easy to lose yourself in the story because it has so much detail on the set. So kind of the founder of realistic theater is Henrik Ibsen. This is to our right here a dollhouse which I saw at MTSU and uh, just a fantastic production um, a translation by a woman from Chattanooga. It, it was just a delightful evening. Um, you saw clippings from Hedda Gabler when you watched the initial uh, documentary for this class. Remember she commits suicide at the end of the play and they had that splatter. Um, this was a very brazen and um, honest look at kind of, you know, these Freudian explorations of psychology. And it was very controversial, and it's still to this day, if it's performed, is controversial. And Henrik Ibsen is not afraid to get his hands dirty. Enemy of the People is the story of a doctor who finds um, bacteria in the water and tells the town about the pollution, and um, nobody wants to hear it because it's going to have a financial effect on their town. And so it's sort of, once again, that struggle between the truth, this scientist, this doctor knowing the truth, and people um, and their willingness to accept that truth. A Doll's House is the a play that I saw at MTSU. Uh, this woman, um, Tregorin, the, the man in the black there, uh, you know, he consistently calls him her doll. Uh, oh, she's just a sweet little doll. And uh, Nora plays the part for him. Um, but it turns out that she's taken out these big loans that she can't afford, and she's just tried to pretend that they don't exist. Um, but she feels, at the end of the play, it comes out that she's feel bullied by her father and by her husband her whole life, and ultimately she leaves her children, which was very, very controversial um, in that Norwegian culture when he wrote that play. Um, that was not that feminist idea uh, that a woman could be in any way hindered by her family was not one that people spoke of, right? So, Henrik Ibsen was all about using the theater to raise awareness on political issues, particularly to speak out um, against societal norms. So, there's me in a play called Good Doctor. Um, and that was a play by Chekhov. Uh, Chekhov, as you can see in, oh, I haven't even opened the book yet, 226. Um, Chekhov creates this wonderfully, like, realistic and intricate language. Now, if we read it, it doesn't sound realistic to our ears because it's 100 years old, right? So give us a break there. But it was not declamatory. It was not to be or not to be. That is the question, right? It didn't have a poetry to it. It was just um, reflecting as if someone had just tape recorded human conversation and they were listening to it. So on page 227, you can hear um, Arena and Masha and Vershinen as they speak to each other as lovers. And there's just this awkwardness, right? Um, I have the honor to introduce myself. Uh, I am very, very glad to be in your house. 
no, oh, you grown up, right? It's kind of like one of those horrible elevator conversations that you have with people like, oh, the weather, you know, <laughs> it just, it just has this sort of mundane quality to it. The, the kind of mundane moments that most classical um, plays would have cut out, you know, they would cut the chit chat, there wouldn't be chit chat. Um, but Chekhov understood that human psychology, what we say in our chit chat and what we um, talk about when we're not talking about what we're really talking about, right? Uh, there's levels and depth to our conversation. So if you go to see a Chekhov play, you may not see a lot of action necessarily. It's going to be more subtext and people talking um uh, t- people talking without actually saying what they mean, right? Uh, you may have had those frank conversations with someone that you're attracted to where you said, hi, I'm attracted to you. But more likely, <laughs> you're going to talk about the weather, you're going to talk about, um, uh, you know, the fact that you like their shirt, and what that really means is I'm attracted to you, right? Uh, Chekhov also had, he was a doctor, and as well as a playwright. And so he had this way of um, incorporating humor and pain into the same experience. There were moments where we're laughing and then the next moment a character is so pitiful that we're crying. So it was not a clear cut genre. Remember when we talked about genres, uh, classically a tragedy end in death and a comedy end in a wedding. Right, it was very cookie cutter, and Chekhov threw all of those formulas out the window, and tried to create something more true to life. Um, so, what I was saying about the subtext is, these are pictures, obviously, from a, a Chekhov play that I did. Is that you, you know, by the time if a good actor is playing Chekhov, by the time we get to the end of the story, uh, we saw it coming. You know, we saw Masha and uh, Vershina, and we've seen them flirting enough that we know that by the end of the play, they're going to run away together, right? The seagull, we know by the end of the play uh, that he's going to commit suicide. So it's just kind of these um, hints at the truth uh, without actually coming out and being outright in the way that they were speaking. And remember, this is right before uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. This is a few generations before that. And so there's a lot of tension in Russia. And so um, there, you know, a lot of the class system kind of implications, kind of the the Downton Abbey, <laughs> I say that in that the uh, people who had servants and the servants are kind of changing their roles. There's this really sad moment at the end of Cherry Orchard where um, this family goes bankrupt, very realistic, right, in the, that it has to do with money. Uh, the family goes bankrupt, and so they're moving out of this big house that they can no longer afford. And the butler, who lived in that house his entire life, rather than going with them, he just lays down and dies. And uh, you have to imagine for people in that way of life, in that way of servanthood, how big of a transition it was for them um, to give up this trade that they'd known their whole lives. In some ways, I'm sure it was freeing, but in other ways, uh, what a waste, you know, to have all these skill sets and no longer have a household that can afford to support you. So um, poetic, beautiful, um, not as overt, not as uh, clear in the dialogue. You have to understand the events of the action rather than just looking to the dialogue to understand what's going on. So when we took realism to an extreme, we have naturalism. Now naturalism was a form of uh, philosophy that was acted out on stage, and this wasn't unheard of. Uh, People, you know, theater's relatively cheap as a propaganda device, right? If you have an idea, you can write a play, and people come see it, and that'll generate a buzz and interest in the ideas that you're, um, you know, trying to get out there. So, they called it a slice of life because they wanted it to be absolutely just like reality. So, as, if we go to see a Henrik uh, Ibsen play, we're going to see the most important moment in Nora's life, right? And there's still going to be a climax and there's still going to be a, a social issue that's trying to be propagated. Whereas naturalism was much more in the documentary style. Um, in, by that, I mean they were trying to just record 
an everyday life of this person and didn't necessarily have to have a climax and it didn't exactly have to have a clear beginning and a middle and an end. It was more interested in just sort of living with these people for two hours. And within that, um, I say one plot, but once again, it's not very plot driven. Um, it is one place and it's in real time. By that I mean the moment we start the play, we're ticking along the clock at the same time that they are. There's not going to be flashbacks. There's not going to be a lapse of time at intermission. It's not going to say 20 years later. And verisimilitude is actually a concept um, astouted by Aristotle and then again in the French neoclassical. And the idea was to keep it simple. Uh, Moliere often wrote with verisimilitude in time in mind. Keep it simple. People get confused if there's too many plots, if there's too much action, if you're trying to jump around to different locations. Um, and so naturalism took that to an extreme and said, let's just have one story kind of going on, one place, and we're going to watch it in real time. You know, we're going to watch it. The time will seemingly pass as we do. So all of that uh, was, of course, reacted against with stylized theater. And I have a picture here of uh, Peter Pan, right, which is mentioned in your script as an obvious reaction to the more slice of life, natural environment. Um, before I move on to Peter Pan, though, I do want to say this is highly affected by psychology because remember, um, we're starting to understand the idea of nurture versus nature, genetics versus circumstance. And so once again, the philosophers were interested in and sort of observing what's going on. Uh, the reason why I put that beautiful Catherine Hepburn uh, DVD cover there is that Eugene O'Neill actually told the story of his mother and her addiction problem but it was so personal to him uh, this naturalistic play kind of just spending an afternoon with his morphine addicted mother um, it was so personal that he asked it not to be published until after he died and I know some of you might have felt that way about your monologues that you shared I usually have some people sort of guardedly share something very personal and um, you know you may use a nom de plume in that situation you may want to use a fake name or wait until after you die to, to publish the the honest truth of your family or your situation or your uh, something you're ashamed about in your life um, so and it is it's a very if you ever get a chance to take a look at Long Day's Journey and Tonight it is a very pitiful and desperate play Okay, moving on to stylized theater. And the two are not as different as you might think. <laughs> uh, really, a lot of these plays that are stylized, and we'll go through a couple different of the mass, massive you know, isms that are out there, but um, most of them are kind of like a dreamlike version of reality, a nightmarish version of reality. They tend to try to tell you about the physical world by exploring it in a dreamlike or metaphysical way. So um, another big thing about these plays is they're on the backdrop of war right? World War One, World War Two. these were major events that shaped um, each one of the lives that these authors will look at today. Uh, this is a play, <laughs> um, The Firebugs. If you can see up on top of that uh, um, scaffolding, you see all those bins up there? That's gas. And uh, this family uh, takes in these two strangers and they're constantly carrying gas upstairs, these big barrels. And, um, you know, the, the couple just welcome them in. Oh, sure, come on in, take the gas upstairs. And this is a chorus of firefighters uh, who speak directly to the audience about how dangerous this is. Uh, and they tell us about the fires going on in their neighborhood. And then all of a sudden at the end of the play, uh, you know, matches are handed to the to the people who live in the house and they say you know we've got you you need to light your own house on fire and uh, we may look at that and think oh that's so absurd just bringing gas into your own house why wouldn't you ask any questions um, but of course this is a metaphor for what went on with the Nazi occupation right um, we saw these absurd things going on and people were um, 
passive and submissive in that situation and they just you know some people not all people but many people just watched it happen as if they were powerless to stand up against it and so um the austrian mass Max Frisch, and he's also a painter, uh, you know, he kind of writes this absurdity, but when you think about it, in some ways, it was an absurd time uh, when things, what was normal and right and real was kind of flipped on its head, and so that's only an extension. Uh, some of this art is an extension of the absurdity of the politics. So, Harry Ape is on page 236. The same author who I just talked about, Eugene O'Neill, don't, yeah, it's the same guy. He just tried on a different style. Um, he, you know, usually wrote in realism or naturalism, but for the hairy ape, he was experimenting with expressionism, which is really more of a German nightmarish kind of thing. Um, uh, if you watch some of the silent movies, uh, Metropolis is an expressionistic uh production. If you're into silent movies, you may have watched that. It may give you a good reference. Uh, but they had a lot of nightmarish, loud noises, um, shock tactics, uh, bright lights. So um, if we look at the dialogue on page 136, um, you can see how he still held on to that realistic dialogue in the way that it's written in dialect, right? Um, will this own watch never end? He writes it with the I, I, not E, E, right? So, uh, dis is a cinch, right? Instead of this, T-H-I-S, he says dis. So, um, uh, he kind of holds on to some elements. But this is very, uh, very much, um, that same shocking and gutsy experimentation, uh, that has to do with expressionism. It's very much a reflection of the industrial age. And so the dehumanization of human beings was a huge theme, if you've seen Metropolis or here in The Hairy Ape. Um, another thing that I want to say as you read this section, and I hope you do, if you haven't yet, pause it and, and read um, this uh, excerpt from Harry Ape. Uh, when he gets down to moida moida, which is obviously murder, murder, um, Mildred faints. And sometimes when we look at moments like this, we say, why is she fainting? Is she just like some silly woman who faints? And I just want to remind everybody that women back then wore corsets, and so they had trouble breathing. <laughs> so if you look at that and you say, how dare she faint, uh, silly Mildred, just remember those corsets are tight, and I have worn them for plays, and trust me, it's hard to get your breath underneath you. And if you are really startled, it, it wouldn't be unusual for you to pass out. Uh, not that I have ever passed out in a corset, but uh, it I can totally understand how it could happen. But the animal imagery, once again, of this worker, this everyday worker turning slowly into an ape, that would have been um, an expression of this question of Darwinism, this question of, um, you know, are we just animals or do we have a higher calling? So very um, in-your-face, angry kind of writing that went on in the Expressionism movement. And this also has very much to do with the economy at this time. Remember, there weren't labor unions. There weren't um, people necessarily standing up for their rights as workers in, in 1920. Um, there was a lot of exploitation. There was a lot of people working endless hours for very small wages, sharecroppers, the kind of things we talked about with Joe Turner's Come and Gone. So a constant image that the... Um, that the writers would go back to is the Sisyphus, who is an ancient Grecian character who was cursed to carry the same rock up a hill or push a rock up a hill every single day. And every day he would wake up the, the next day and the rock would be at the bottom of the hill and he would have to carry it or push it up the hill again. And uh, this is kind of speaks to the mundane rhythms of life. And if you're like me and you get bored with a routine, you get bored with... Um, you know, things being always the same, then you may relate to this metaphor as deeply as I do. So, meta theater. 
this is one of those moments where I hate that I have to deduce these entire movements into like a moment. Uh, so if someone says to you, that's so meta, <laughs> they're, what, what they're saying is that it's a comment on itself. It's a self commentary. And so when we say meta theater, this was a play within a play. So if you've ever watched a movie where there may be the actors in the movie or shooting a movie, <laughs> right? That would be a meta film. That would be a moment where the theater is examining itself and the film is examining uh, the nature of film. Yeah, kind of a complicated concept and also for me to simplify it so much would be controversial. I'm sure there's a uh, dramatic literacist somewhere rolling over in their grave. Um, But six characters in search of an author is just what the title says. There are these six characters. An author starts writing a play and starts working out their stories and then he kind of gets bored with it and forgets it, right? And so when the six characters show up on stage, they're confused. They're like, wait, what's our story? Are you, you're playing me. Well, we got to figure it out. And so they know bits and pieces of the truth, but it's not linear. It's kind of, do you have a, maybe a a memory that you have from when you were little and you can kind of put bits and pieces of it together, but you can't really, it's sort of fragmented. So we've used before this um, imagery of theater being a mirror held up to nature. And so um, in this case, it would be a broken mirror holding up to nature. We can only remember bits and pieces. And Pirandello, who wrote six characters in search of an author, it's worth stating kind of some backstory on him. He had to have his wife committed. Um, his sons were uh, lost in World War One and held prisoner, but then they returned back to them. Uh, he lost all of his family wealth. He had uh, suicidal tendencies. So when he writes these dark themes, they're coming from a real place. It's not just um, for the sake of being poetic and artsy. Um, so these characters who come in are the characters and they're talking to actors who are trying to portray their story. And so if we look at page um, uh, 238, uh, he, they begged their director to sort of tell their story for them. And um, the father is talking to the director and he asks, who are you? And the director says, what impudence? This so-called character wants to know who I am? And the father says, Senor, a character may always ask a man who he is, for a character has true life, defined by his characteristics. He is always at the least a somebody, but a man, now don't take this personally, a man is generalized beyond identity. He is a nobody. Right? Um, So what he's kind of getting at is is as characters on a page, they have a very finite definition of who they are. You were able to sub up an entire character from Joe Turner's Come and Gone in two to three pages, (laughs) right? Um, Albeit, you know, successfully, but you could simplify and deduce, okay, this is who Jeremy is. But if you were to ask yourself, what's my character analysis? What motivates me on a day-to-day life? Could I simplify myself to that extent? You probably couldn't because humans are complex. Humans are um, not always aware of their own motivations. And so what the sort of critique that's going on, this conversation that an actor is having with a character who's having it with his playwright, uh, this sort of... um, confusion that's going on is because real life is so much more complicated than a play. We can deduce and simplify and easily deconstruct a play for its meaning and its themes. But if you look at your last five years of your life, uh, I would be very proud of you if you could easily deduce the themes of your life and uh, how you ought to proceed. (laughs) Um, Moving down to the same little bit of wisdom, the very last line that the father says, uh, and the director asks, what does this prove? Oh, nothing, senor, only the show that if beyond our illusions, we have no ultimate reality. So your reality as well, your reality that touches and feels and breathes today will be unmasked tomorrow as nothing but yesterday's illusions. Let me read that again. 
your reality will be unmasked tomorrow as nothing but yesterday's illusions. I have a friend who recently um, had a really bad breakup with her uh, serious fiance, actually. Uh, And the thing that she just kept saying to me was, uh, you know, was it real? Did he really care about me? Uh, You know, why did he call it off if he really? Is this just an illusion? And you may have had an experience like that in your life um, where you wondered the authenticity of the experience. Um, And that's a very philosophical moment of truth for you to say what was real and what wasn't real. Um, My favorite uh, poet who is a contemporary of this guy is T.S. Eliot. And yes, my little boy's name is Eliot after T.S. Eliot, my favorite poet. Uh, He has a line in my favorite poem, uh, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, where he says, prepare a face to meet the faces that that meet you. Um, And that is kind of referring to putting on a persona for certain people. So maybe you have to be a mother to one person and you get to be uh, a fun little sister sister to somebody else. Or maybe you get to be um, many different faces that we wear for different people in our lives. And uh, of course, Prufrock is doing this in a way that's artificial and he hates that he has to put on these fake faces. But in another sense, um, you know, these masks that we wear are the realities that we live into. There are different sides to every person. And this mask analogy is one that uh, Eugene O'Neill favored. Uh, obviously, Pirandello favored it. Um, Brecht actually physically used masks to sort of portray this persona, this psyche, and how we deal with the mask as an extension from our ideas. Um, obviously, this state of six characters in search of an author uh, is very abstract, as is the play. Uh, he's holding there the boy who dies at the end, and the other boy on the right there, I'm presuming that's after he's shot himself, uh, which is how the play ends. Uh, so it's a very dark play, but if you were to actually start at the beginning of the play, it, it can be witty at moments. Um, when Pirandello first staged it, uh, there was a riot in the theater. So it was not well received, to say the least. His daughter and he had to sneak out the side door. Um, So if you're a philosopher, if you're someone who um, really wrestles with um, the metaphysical, this might be an interesting read or movie for you to watch. So yes, I have dabbled in these art forms. Um, That's Kafka's Metamorphosis there on the left. Uh, I I don't know if you've ever read the short story. Uh, Gregor Sambosa awoke one morning to discover that he had turned into a bug, right? And so that guy in the back is acting like a bug. Um, And this play was very absurd. And it was... um, directed and um, translated and adapted uh, by Stephen Burkhoff and he was trying to accommodate these acting styles. He was actually um, in the, let's see, um, in the style, he was of the, sorry, did I say Stephen Burkhoff was the was the adapter, but these are Meyerhold's techniques that we were using of kind of clowning, uh, pantomiming, because when you go into these stylized plays, it's not like, uh, you know, if I asked you to do a traditional uh, character analysis, as they say on the bottom of page 240, it would be really uh, sort of an exercise in futility, the same way that in the second chapter in the book you had that discussion question over um, the boy and the girl that fall in love in the cafe and by the end they're flying through the stars remember that play and by John Patrick Shanley Um, you know if you were to sit down and say okay here's your character analysis of this generic woman right it's sort of an exercise in futility because there's not a lot of like backstory there you don't know who their parents were well you know that the the boy had a mother who was very monstrous to him but there's not a lot of deep psychology which is is often representative in these stylized plays. I was playing a mother, kind of an archetypal mother for Gregor Samsa. And so, you know, you have to explore other ways of acting. And like I said, Meyerhold and some of these acting um, theorists sort of came up with ways to approach that. Um, so... 
Moving on to Samuel Beckett. Waiting for Godot is a play about um, two men who are waiting for this person to come who's Godot, who is going to save them in some way. And you watched a clip um, there. Uh, I don't know what waiting for Godot means. Let me just say that first. <laughs> waiting for Godot or waiting for Godot. You could hear either one. Um, there are obvious moments of... Um, I want to say preachiness or morality. I think the way that Pozo uh, treats his pig, as he calls him, dragging him around stage by a noose, um, to me that's an obvious statement about um, capitalism or people of wealth. But Samuel Beckett is uh, very elusive and doesn't want to commit to any sort of interpretation of Waiting for Godot, which is why I love that little Sesame Street cartoon uh, that I sent you to on YouTube. Um, <laughs> You know, because it is that there's so many people who sit around and theorize what was Samuel Beckett talking about. And he he just very famously says, art has nothing to do with clarity. Uh, but the one thing that I can say for Samuel Beckett is, is he's so poetic. Uh, phrases like, I can't go on, I must go on. Uh, you know, I've said that to myself <laughs> when I look at uh, feeling melodramatic and looking at a long day's work. I can't go on, I must go on. And I think in some ways he captures the human condition of constantly waiting for whatever's going to happen in our lives, right? Um, metaphysically, I definitely had, you know, oh, I will have arrived when I get a professorship and then I get my professorship and I'm like, oh, well, I will have arrived when I have a child and now that I've got a child, I'm like, I will have arrived uh, when I, you know, so we kind of can sometimes um, dis, uh, kind of be disenchanted with our own reality and, and sort of waiting for some magic ticket in the future. So uh, to be honest, though, I do find Waiting for Godot a very tedious play, and I can totally understand why people walked out the first time it was performed and many times after. Um, but it's very clever. It's very uh, playful at times. The clip I gave you was very serious because I do love the poetry of that moment. Um, but there's a lot of times when they're telling each other jokes and they're um, performing for each other. And that's why it's attracted big names like Steve Martin and Nathan Lane, who've performed it on Broadway. Because it is a very charming and playful um, sort of play. He has other plays uh, such as Happy Days where a woman is buried up to her waist in sand and she's trying to make the best of it. She gets up and brushes her teeth and uh, basically the uh, once again, that syphysis like feeling of this parable and the ridiculousness of their, uh, you know, absurd situations. But once again, Samuel Beckett uh, was in France when the Nazis were greeted with open arms. They actually held parades uh, in Paris for the Nazis because they were welcoming them in, you know. And uh, Samuel Beckett was part of the resistance, and he saw the absurdity of that fascism uh, and felt helpless in that situation. So when they're riding from this place of hopelessness, you have to put it in the context of World War II for this author. Um, all of those Parisian writers, we look at Ionesco, he wrote a play called The Rhinoceros, where people are turning into rhinoceri, and uh, rhinoceros, what's the plural of rhinoceros? I don't know. Uh, but uh, Zero Mostel is in a movie where he is like actively turning into a rhinoceros and pantomiming, huffing and puffing and drilling through walls like a rhinoceros would, and you just watch it and you say, this is just absurd, this is just ridiculous. Uh, well, so is opening your home to fascists, so... Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, once again, it was a protest theater. All right, so now we move into my favorite of this era, um, which is still hard to encapsulate into a 20-minute talk, but uh, that is Brecht and the Theater of Alienation. He chose uh, the good person of Szechuan or the good woman of Szechuan, um, but I actually... Uh, much prefer Mother Courage. This is just a play that I would love to act in before I die. Uh, there's Meryl Streep in the title role of um, of the mother. Spoiler alert, all of her children die in the war, and as a spoil of war. Um, she has a um, 
a cart that she pushes through the war and other people are heading away from the action and she is pushing her way and her cart right in down where the action is happening and she does that because she's starving and she needs um these soldiers to buy liquor from her she needs them to buy blankets she needs them to buy um, goods and services Uh, you know she has all these lines about the foods going bad we got to get closer to the front lines and as a result her children um, are part of the spoils of war Um, and so it's kind of it's partially about the profiteering that happens off of the war it's partially um, about the desperate times and um, you know Brecht was a communist and so this is a woman who is of low means trying to survive any way that she can um, power to the people kind of thing but till Brecht the author here with his little cigar as he's often pictured uh, believed that art is not a mirror held up to reality but a hammer with which to shape it he's commonly given that quote it's actually a Trotsky quote which if you're a political person you know Trotsky was a communist writer um but he believed that art should change your mind we're not just going to show you a happy picture of your own reality we're going to try to politically change your ideas by showing you the harsh harsh truths the harsh realities um so uh he called his theater epic theater which right now is like a buzzword you know that's so epic uh, I, I hear my teenagers that I work with uh, say it's so epic uh, but he, he actually called it epic theater because he wanted it to have big ideas so like you look at the good person of Szechuan it's set in China he does he's never actually been to China he just wants to tell a timeless and universal big huge story mother courage and her children is not actually told in Nazi Germany even though it's about war profiteering it's told uh, in the War of Roses or the Hundred Years War, right? And so it needs to have that larger than life, timeless, universal appeal so that people can look at it and say, okay, this is an isolated incident. This is a trend that goes on over and over again in reality. He didn't want people to go into a hypnotic state. He didn't want you to go sit in the seat and be numbed, right? We talked about the Romans and their circus and bread, their panem. He was against that. He didn't want the masses to be sort of, um, you know, just enjoying their summer blockbuster. He wanted them to be constantly interrupted and jerked around and um, upset by what was going on. So his songs, if you were to Google a Brecht song, I don't make you listen to one, but if you're um, a music student or you're particularly interested in music, they're very dissonant the way that he wrote them. Uh, He wanted to use um, all of the notes because he felt like that was more fair. It's very theoretical. Um, The humor is very dark there, but it is funny. Um, You know, Mother Courage says, I've been pricked on all four corners of the uh, compass. (laughs) she's got four children um uh, so it's body and it's real um there's a lot of violence obviously all of her children die um and so it's very startling the 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 violence and once again this is performed oh i haven't said that yet um you know brecht opened the berliner ensemble you may have seen in the video um right after world war ii is over so it's Berlin is literally in rubble and this theater survived that they're performing in but um, this is very much a broken community who's coming to see this theater and they would have wanted a voice for the truths that they were experiencing Um, he was very anti-Aristotelian he didn't like Aristotle he didn't believe that people would sit and watch a play just to understand the plot he didn't believe in catharsis He didn't want people to um, feel for the characters necessarily. Uh, He would announce, this is the scene where um, Mother Courage loses her first child, right? So we know at the beginning that which one of the the children there is going to die in the scene. (laughs) He, um, He wanted to surprise and shock people. And he would put that as a projection on the wall, the scene in which so-and-so dies. Um, 
I tried to say that as nicely as I could. The characters make questionable decisions, right? Um, most of us would look at Mother Courage and say, I think after I lost my first two kids, I would have taken the others and turned back, <laughs> right? But she, he wrote these flawed characters. He wasn't like Aristotle. He didn't believe that we could only tell the story of a noble king. We needed... Um, he believed in telling the story of the common man and showing these flawed characters, these true-to-life human characters who made questionable decisions. Um, there is Meryl Streep looking aggressive as she's heading into the front lines. Um, he wasn't afraid to be crass. He wasn't afraid to show the ugly. His music sounded dissonant and uncomfortable. This music wasn't meant to be a lullaby or to um, delight us. It was meant to be, I mean, you kind of think of it as, as heavy metal, kind of having a um, shocking appeal. Not that it sounds like heavy metal, but um, they show suffering, not afraid to show um you know, this unbearable hopelessness. Um, so this is a very, uh, you may have noticed in the pictures that I showed before of like people just on scaffolding rather than trying to like, you know, in that um, frisch that uh, fire bugs play, they were just on scaffolding to represent the house. And that was very Brechtian. Brecht thought, we're not going to fill in the gaps. We're not going to have every single detail on stage. In fact, he wanted you to see the technicians because remember, he doesn't want you to get caught up in the play and just sit back and enjoy it. He wanted you to see the gears turn so he famously took away all the curtains so that you could see the ropes moving things in and out. He would have stage hands bring uh, signs on stage. Um, no sense of illusion. So, and I've already said that his music was difficult. Oh, now we've gotten to the end. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, I. <laughs> Uh, I think it's sort of fitting that uh, I had to do that twice, seeing as how we're in absurd theater and <laughs> there's a lot of repetition and meaninglessness. <laughs> uh, oh, well. So, um, so what's the takeaway of this upsetting, harsh, um, clever and witty and poetic theater? Uh, these are the extremes that I've shown you today. This absurdism is too an extreme, extremely alienating, extremely ugly, extremely frightening. Um, these guys were blazing the trails in, in that they were avant-garde. Uh, we see hints of this in modern plays. Um, you know, if we look at a character uh, like Tennessee Williams, you know, he may have not shown a lot of people fully committing suicide, but if we look at a play like Streetcar Named Desire, where Blanche is taken away and institutionalized, it, he wasn't afraid to talk about mental illness, Tennessee Williams wasn't, um, because possibly of the Henrik Ibsens and August Strindbergs who went before him, right? We have um, that everyday rhetoric going on in plays, um, you know, something like West Side Story, possibly because of the way that Eugene O'Neill wrote. Now, not a lot of people are going to pay money to see Waiting for Godot. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to put my ticket there either. <laughs> but it's under, it's important for you to understand that these were the trailblazers. These were the people who were not afraid to give us reality in its harshest forms in order to, um, in some cases, create, create catharsis and other places start conversations and um, mold people into what um, these philosophers thought was right. So once again, I hope this wasn't a freak show too much. I hope that you see uh, the poetry and the meaningfulness um, in this. I hope you'll go back and kind of look at these uh, sections again. Um, you know, on the bottom of page 244 for the good person of Szechuan, um, you know, she, it's kind of this poetic afterwards. And it's saying, you know, this, this isn't a clean cut ending. It doesn't have a clear resolution. Um, it's simply that it's you must end this play. Tell us and your own good woman of Szechuan can come to a good ending if she can. Honorable folks, you search and we will trust that you will find the way. You must, you must, you must. So this theater is uncomfortable and it's up to you. So as always, thank you for listening.